Uh, it was about, uh, well, it was actually at the grand opening of the, the outdoor campus uh, the year ago in September that uh, former Commissioner Olson asked me, well, Scott, now that you're done with this portion of things, what are you going to do next? And uh, I hadn't been able to think that far ahead, but off the top of my head, I said, well, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should do some shooting range complexes or some more expand our shooting range operation. It doesn't seem like we've got a, a, a very big inventory there. So um, that's kind of what we've been looking at over the last year and a half is some opportunities to, to expand the opportunity for uh, recreational shooters. And um, as you guys know, uh, we run a grant program for uh, these, these shooting clubs. Uh, we help, uh, help them build concrete walks around trap houses. We pay for pat traps, uh, pay for portions of pat traps. Um, anything that they need uh, that qualifies as, a, as a, an eligible expense, um, we help with those, those opportunities. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is uh, some, some opportunities that, that we're developing uh, on GFMP land and, and projects that we're actually uh, putting on the ground. Um, back in October when we were in Deadwood, uh, the Fall River Gun Club uh, came to you guys and, and, and uh, talked to you about the project that we uh, were proposing down there. Um, we were able to make a land swap. Uh, we traded out a, a GPA for another piece of property that's right along Highway 79, just north of the, uh, the turnoff for Hot Springs. And uh, that, that's what this photo is, is, the, is, is at least a, a little bit of what that property looks like. Um, you can see why we wanted this. Um, it's a very flat piece of ground with some, some very uh, elevated uh, um, hills around it. And, and it's just, uh, it, it's really a nice spot for us to, to look at trying to develop this, this shooting range project. And um, I want to start there and then I've got uh, three other ones that I'd like to visit with you about as well. Starting out with the, the Fall River Gun Club, uh, in the FY14 budget, we asked you to approve, and you did approve, a $150,000 budget for this particular uh, project. Um, those bids were opened up, uh, I believe, at our last commission meeting, uh, whatever that date was, first, early May. And uh, the bids came in uh, really attractively. Um, we, uh, we have a base bid of right or, just under $100,000. Um, what we did is we bid some concrete work and some other things uh, as an alternate, and, and that uh, alternate work was about $16,000. Um, we want to uh, uh, cover the shooting benches, uh, and, and the materials for that uh, is just over $4,000. And then we also, this is, a, this is not uh, real accessible to any other uh, facilities, so we're going to put a, a, a vault toilet in there. Um, so right now, uh, our budget sits at right at $130,000, which I think is, uh, we're, we're really happy with. It also gives us just a little bit of flexibility to uh, start uh, to, to help the club with the development of some benches and that kind of thing. Um, this is the actual design that we are, are working on right now. Um, they broke ground last week, and uh, I just had a conference call with the Fall River Gun Club last night. Um, they have basically uh, already completed the rough-in work on the road off of Highway 79. They have uh, also roughed in the parking lot, and they have most of this berm already completed um, just in a week. Um, our contract runs through the end of August, uh, or excuse me, the middle of August. That's what we gave them as a completion date. And uh, from what I'm hearing, they're probably going to be done with the dirt work by the 1st of July and have the concrete work done by the middle of July. So they'll be a month ahead of schedule, weather permitting. Um, just to give you a little idea of what we've got going on here, uh, again, this is a 50-yard pistol range. There'll be 10 lanes right in there. Uh, uh, this is a concrete walkway that comes down here. Uh, this will be 10 benches uh, right there and 10 benches along that. So we'll have actually 20 benches for uh, the rifle shooters. They'll be able to shoot 100 yards at this distance. They'll be able to shoot another 100 yards from, from this location as well. And they'll also be able to shoot 200 yards. Um, we put this 100 yard in there because we figure um, most people, that's what they're doing. They're shooting at 100 yards. They're sighting in their deer rifles. Um, but we wanted to, at least with the, the beginning of this range, be able to offer up to 200 yards uh, uh, shooting distance. And uh, that's what we've been able to accomplish. Um, so basically what we get out of this deal is an access road off of the highway. We get uh, a 50 yard pistol and 22 range uh, that will provide 10 shooting locations and we'll get 20 locations uh, of 100 and 10 locations of 200. 
So 30 total locations, um, which we feel like is a pretty good opportunity for that part of the country. Um, we've also heard a lot of people from Rapid City saying, you know, this is, this is great. We're already going to be uh, planning our trips down there. And, and uh, uh, so we're, there's a lot of interest in this. Just uh, kind of going over it again, this is, a, this is our basic uh, 10 benches, 10 locations. And again, that'll be divided up into three uh, different, different areas, the 10 there, the 10 here, and the 10 here. That will not be a connected uh, 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 overhang. That'll just be uh, um, uh, two separate 10, 10 station overhangs. This is uh, what we've got for a concept as far as uh, uh, what we're going to cover the, the benches with. Um, pretty simple design. It's actually what uh, the Gun Club proposed to us, uh, working with our engineers. This is, this is where we're going to be, I think. Um, the the uh, contractor that's on the ground right now, we're going to work with him to get those poles set. And then the uh, Gun Club themselves is actually going to put the, the roof on it. We're going to buy the materials, um, and, and they're going to frame out the rest of it and uh, put the tin on top for us. So that'll be part of their contribution to this as well. So that'll save us, you know, five, five, six, seven thousand dollars, which obviously is great. Um, this is, uh, that's the, what I've got on uh, Hot Springs. Um, again, this is moving forward right now. We've got contractors on the ground and, and uh, we, look, we look to be shooting there by the end of the summer, which is great. Um, we do have a few more things to work through. We've got an MOU with the club. Um, they have, per, they have did, offered to provide oversight on the range, which is, uh, I, I want to use oversight loosely. That's, uh, they, they're going to have a certified range officer there during the day. Um, and uh, just make sure that we, we don't have people bringing out TVs and refrigerators and stuff to shoot, yeah, bowling pins. Uh, uh, and, and the MOU lines that out, what, what are approved targets and, uh, you know, approved practices. And, and, and then we've got some signage things to figure out. But um, we feel like we're in pretty good shape. And, and the conference call that I had with the, the club last night, uh, they, were in, they were in a good mood. And, and we're happy to see some progress out there. So I feel like that's moving right along. Uh, what we talked about last night, we, I kind of challenged the club to come up with something that uh, was going to be real accessible for the public. Um, what they proposed last night was a 9 a.m. in the morning opening to one hour before sunset. Um, the, 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 fa the idea behind that is that we aren't shooting at 7 o'clock in the morning and bothering the neighbors and that we give them an hour before bed, before the sun goes down to, to kind of uh, in, enjoy their evening. So um, that's what we're talking about right now. I, I, I wouldn't say that that's uh, set in stone, but uh, I, I guess uh, we'll talk through it. But I, I guess I don't see any issues with that right now. Yes, it will be gated. Yep. Fenced around the perimeter and, and gated right off the road. Um, the second project I want to talk to you about is uh, the Wahi Downstream uh, shooting range, which is right out here on 1806, just below the dam. Uh, we've had an existing range here. Uh, it, it's been there forever. Uh, my understanding is it's been there for 40 or 50 years. Um, the Corps of Engineers established that portion of it. Um, Parks actually leases a, a good chunk of this land in here, and, and then we help them out uh, with management of the uh, the shooting range itself. This existing range, I think there are five tables there right now. They're old metal tables. Um, it's strictly a 100-yard range. Um, they do have uh, a target set up at 50 yards. The use on this thing is, is amazing. Uh, Parks has a counter across the, the gravel road there, and uh, it is well over 1,000 visitors a month. Um, and, and that's throughout the year. I, I mean, February and March, and, 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 and then especially when we get into, you know, those seasons, uh, uh, we're heading into deer season where people are getting out and shooting a little bit more, um, it jumps up dramatically. Um, it's, it's just, it, it's crazy the amount of use that we've gotten. We feel like this is a great uh, operation for us to, to make some uh, improvements on this range. The, the design that we have right now is uh, we have one 300-yard shooting bench that will give uh, people an opportunity to shoot a little bit longer range. This is actually a 100-yard uh, berm shooting from these benches. Um, there's actually 10 benches that will be able to shoot 100 yards, and then there's a, there's a berm down the middle of that as well. 
with the, number, the amount of traffic that we get at this range, um, our, our idea be, by separating those two lanes is that we allow people to go down and check on one side while the other people are shooting on the other. Um, so that's why we, have, we, we, we went with the little, uh, little more money, a little more design, and put that center berm down there. We also have uh, some 50 yard, uh, I think it's two benches at 50 yards, which will allow people to shoot rim fires or if they're, you know, uh, don't want that 100 yard distance to start out with, um, we'll have that. So that gives us a total of 13 benches across that area right there. This berm is actually 25 feet high. It's a, it's a big rascal. So uh, there's a lot of dirt work that needs to get done here. Um, over here we have another berm uh, and four locations, three or four locations, I can't remember. Um, that would be our pistol area, so people can come in and shoot handguns. Um, right now, the handgun shooters have to shoot with the, the rifle shooters, and, and that can cause some complications. So uh, we feel like separating these things out um, will give us the maximum use of the facility. This is a proposed expansion if we need it in the, in the future for some more pistol shooting. And another uh, issue that we've had in this range is people using uh, the, the existing area, the 100-yard range, to um, set up and shoot shotgun. And uh, what we've done is provided an area over here uh, where people can park their vehicles, put down a, a foot thrower or a hand thrower or whatever and be able to shoot shotgun here. And we've, what we're planning here is we, we've got about enough room for five or six people to be standing out, up there at any time. So um, we're trying to separate everything out, give everybody their own space and, and accommodate this traffic that we've got going on down at Oahe downstream. So. We are going to close the old one. Yep, and I was just going to get into that, uh, Commissioner Spies. Um, the, I think I got a slide out of order, but uh, the the issue that we're having with the old range is cleanup. By closing the old range, the Corps of Engineers is asking us to clean up the old range and remove the lead. We have sampled this location three different times, um, both times with a, a plan that was been approved by the Corps of Engineers. Um, each time they've come back to us and say, said, well, you need to do a little bit more. You need to do a little bit more. This isn't quite what we were thinking it was going to be. And um, this, this last time, uh, we, we feel like we've got it. We feel like we've gotten to the, the we've satisfied what their uh, requirements are of us. Um, we have a sampling plan that we're sending off to Omaha uh, first part of next week. Um, basically, we, we've sampled the entire range here, including about 75 yards uh, behind where our existing berm is. Um, we know where those contaminants are. What we're going to be able to do is to be able to go in there, take about four inches of dirt off of the floor of the existing shooting range, as well as a bunch of dirt off of the existing berm. We're going to be able to transfer it down and, and locate it in, on the face of this, this big berm down here. They're going to let us move that lead from here and move it down here is basically what it amounts to. And then we'll resample up here to make sure that we got everything that we needed to. Um, it's been quite an ordeal with those folks, but uh, we, we feel like we're in a good spot now and, and able to move forward. So, uh, construction on this range probably isn't going to be until first, you know, early spring, uh, late spring next year, if we can get everything to come together. So, uh, one interesting note on this is that uh, we were able to grab some dirt out of the uh, Oahe downstream when they had their flooding down there. Um, they had some dirt that needed to be excavated. Um, we were able to work with the contractor that was doing that work, and they brought us a big pile of dirt that's going to allow us to be incorporated into the berms, which obviously cuts our costs on things. So it, uh, it, it worked well, other than someone needed to flood in order to make it work well. So The uh, third project I want to talk to you about a little bit is, uh, is a concept that we are stealing, I guess, from Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska has this building located in one of their state parks just west of Omaha. And uh, Tony and I and Secretary Vonka were, were on site for a, a, a conference and were able to go out and visit this. And uh, I don't believe Secretary Vonka ever got into this building, but Tony and I were able to. And then I took a, a group of my folks down and, and we toured it again. And, and um, it, it's a, what this building is designed for is air rifles. You can see. Uh, in, inside here, they've got, they've got the building split into two, and they've got uh, is it five locations on each side of the building, so actually ten lanes that uh, they shoot air rifles on. And uh, we feel like this concept is a great concept for us at the outdoor campuses to be able to, to shoot these air rifles. 
Now, the one thing that I'll, I'll tell you is that as I've visited with our folks at the outdoor campus, is that we're gonna take this and we're gonna build on it a little bit. Um, the air rifle thing is great. We are gonna, we're gonna maintain that uh, idea. Um, but my folks are telling me that we also need a place to shoot archery indoors. And uh, the only time that we can do archery classes right now, for the most part, is during the summer. And what we're, what we're looking at is the same concept that Nebraska has, where we split the building into two. One side would be dedicated to the, the pellet guns, uh, the permanent air rifle pellet gun uh, lanes, and we feel like we can put eight of those on a side. And then on the other side, this side, let's say, um, we'd be able to have an open space where we can shoot archery, but we'd also be able to shoot pellet guns in there as well, or air rifles in there as well. It'd be more of a multi-purpose kind of an area that would uh, allow for some flexibility at the campuses. So uh, we feel like this is the best design. Uh, right now, we're, this is uh, pretty much a concept. Uh, I do have the, the blueprints from Nebraska, and, and that's what we've based our cost estimates on. Uh, we do have some issues, uh, of course, at, uh, in Sioux Falls. Uh, the, uh, everything that's built there is in the floodplain, so we have to be cognizant of that. And we have been working with the city of Sioux Falls, uh, we met with their engineers to talk about lo locating this facility. And uh, I I've worked with Bill Myers, one of our engineers, to come up with a concept that would require would not require us to build this building up and, and bring in so much fill. And uh, as soon as we start doing that, it, it gets into a bunch of drainage issue and cost issues. And, and uh, we're looking at actually uh, a building that we would design that we could actually be able to take some water. We would have concrete everything up to a certain uh, level and be able to take some water on and then go in and be able to clean it up and, and keep on going. So uh, we'll, we'll see if the city is willing to, to partner with us on that or, or approve that idea. Um, at Outdoor West uh, in Rapid City, I, I think uh, the biggest issue for us is going to be the site there to be able to locate it close enough to the existing building. And we've also got a parking issue there, which Secretary Bonk reminds me of every time he goes out there. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look to maybe try to remedy both of those in, in one fell swoop here. But uh, uh, my plan is, is to work with uh, Sioux Falls first, uh, get that thing uh, to a state where we can move it into a contract, and then uh, uh, you know, move on to Rapid City. Uh, we'll, I'm, I'm, I'm visiting with those folks out there right now, and we're, we're working through some ideas. But I think the, the construction will happen first in Sioux Falls and then on to Rapid City. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Isn't that what you taught me? Just say no. <laughs> we, uh, we, in the FY14 budget, we have uh, two hundred thousand dollars for both of these ranges, and uh, we we feel like that's probably enough to to cover one. Um, what we're going to look to is private donations and working with the Parks and Wildlife Foundation to, to come up with some matching funds and, uh, and, and be able to accomplish both of those projects with the existing budget that we have out there now. So. Uh, once I would be... Pe This, the, the, I understand exactly what you're saying, Commissioner Spies. Um, if, on this side, uh, these are somewhat, well, I guess on both sides that they have in, in, uh, um, uh, in uh, Nebraska. They have permanent uh, target systems. These are actually on a garage door opener that slide back and forth, and these are a little less permanent, but they've got some, uh, some things built in order to take care of those targets. The other issue is that the, uh, the, the guns that they actually use are obviously air guns. And the, the center of this building, they've got uh, one or two air compressors where they have lines that run out to the, these, uh, these stations. And uh, they're hooked right into the air gun so that you don't have to use CO2 can, uh, canisters. Um, they've got, uh, it, it's really a slick system. Um, again, from the safety standpoint, I guess, would be another uh, consideration where we've got permanent dividers in between those two. Um, I'm not saying that uh, we, we, we couldn't entertain that thought, but um, I, I do like the idea of having a dedicated pellet gun 
Um, you know, because we, we have visions of opening this up to the public too um, and allowing for some public access to this where they can just come in and, and shoot at certain times um, as well as conducting our, our hunt safe classes. Uh, I've talked with Arden Peterson and, and, and he even believes that in Sioux Falls we'd be able to uh, complete our, our field day requirement right here in this facility. So uh, I, I think there's some advantages to having that permanent dedicated area, but it, it's certainly something that we can, we can visit about to see if that makes more sense to have the multi-use. Uh, last project I wanted to visit with you about is, is kind of a unique project. Um, this, it's up in Mobridge. Um, Mobridge, this, this, is, uh, this is actually on Parks land uh, uh, up just north of Mobridge. Um, it's, a, it's a shooting range that has been in place for several years. We've got an active shooting club up there. Um, they have worked with us uh, through the grant process to build this structure and, and do some targeting things. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's time for an update at this range as well. Um, th they were able to, I'm not sure how this process works, but I'm definitely gonna figure it out. They were able to work with the National Guard to come in, and the National Guard is going to do all their berm work for them. Uh, they're doing 640 feet of berm work that is 12 feet high. It's 25 feet wide at the base, goes up 12 feet, um, and the National Guard is going to provide all the labor for that and equipment and, and get this done for them. So that is a, that's a great, uh, a, a great money-saving uh, opportunity here. And I know that the National Guard is also working down in Yankton uh, to do some stuff in an archery range down there. So obviously they're interested in this and, and, and that's an avenue that I need to uh, explore a little bit more and see if we can't find some ways for them to, to help us out. But uh, at, at this Mobridge uh, facility, they're going to put in another shelter that is gonna allow for another 10 uh, shooting lanes. Uh, so they'll bring them up to a total of 20 covered shooting ranges. They're gonna go in and, and work on some benches and uh, update uh, what they've got there. Uh, they are going to uh, uh, upgrade the uh, access road and expand the parking lot. Um, and, and they're going to do all this for $66,000, which uh, 66000 is real money, but it, it's a, um, they're getting an amazing amount of work done for $66,000. So uh, just wanted to give you a quick update on, on that Mobridge uh, project. That's going to be another great range. Um, I guess the, the final statement I would make is that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing shooting range or shooting complex type stuff in Rapid City and Sioux Falls with these indoor facilities, but you'll notice that the two outdoor facilities that I'm talking about, one's in Mobridge and one's down by Hot Springs, it's a lot easier to put a shooting range into a place where there isn't a lot of people, and that's unfortunate. Um, it would, nothing would tickle me more than to be able to go in and put one within about two miles of Sioux Falls. Um, I haven't given up on that idea, but it, there, there are definitely some constraints that we have to work through there, and uh, um, I'll, we'll, we'll continue to see if we can do that to try to get some more shooting opportunity a little closer to more population, population centers, but uh, it, it is difficult, uh, whether it's the price of land, whether it's the encroachment from development, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of issues there, and, and uh, like I said, we haven't given up on it, but it, it hasn't come to fruition yet, so. That's what I have. Is there questions? If not. On to my mission work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. thinking. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you bet. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> uh, next, so if you go, go back, go back the up. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tom gave you a, a snapshot of what happened with our spring goose uh, tank, and Keith will give you a more uh, comprehensive review of how that went this year. Okay. All right, guys, uh, if you recall from the last meeting, I gave you a real quick snapshot, some preliminary numbers. Um, all of our hunter harvests, are, our reports are in. We've got some final numbers and some final uh, stats for you folks real quick. I've got about 10 slides. So uh, obviously the Spring Canada Goose Program, that's a picture there. Pretty harsh conditions uh, in most eastern South Dakota this past April. Uh, just to review, right there, 2012 Fish and Wildlife Service breeding estimate was 270,000 resident Canada geese. Um, and that, that's what our management objective is, which we established in 2010. Uh, currently, obviously, the population exceeds our management goals. 
It's really been a significant expenditure of the department, particular to the wildlife damage program. Um, since 2000, we've spent more than $4.3 million. So uh, that's a significant chunk of change there. Um, Eastern South Dakota, pretty low landowner tolerance. Again, uh, commodity prices have been at record and uh, a, lot of, a lot of big water with a lot of geese and uh, more and more concern each year. Um, the landowner, for the most part, has been pretty quiet this year so far um, and, and last year as well. And I attribute that to the, uh, the hard work that our staff does and the, the work that they put out there. They've been really working with our landowners a lot and doing a good job. Uh, we've also been sub-permitting landowners to kill geese on these problem areas as well. We've done that. This will be the uh, fourth year now. That's starting to gain some traction. More and more people are starting to hear about it. Um, I had a good report from uh, southeastern South Dakota earlier this week that uh, a lot of the historic complaints that they've been working on, they were able to handle um, just by giving that landowner uh, uh, basically a kill permit. And then we've also... Uh, tried to increase bag limits during the August management take, early September season. Um, we actually instituted the August management take in 2010 for the first time. So just trying some different management approaches um, from the last three years to try to curb that uh, population growth. So that has uh, our agency asking what's next. Uh, and that's where we brought forward you folks uh, several months ago, uh, what we call the Spring Canada Goose Program, where we utilize that Fish and Wildlife Service permit we went ahead and authorized the take of 7,000 birds, um, and we selected 140 different uh, volunteer hunters to assist us with that. Each one of those volunteers could harvest up to 50 Canada geese per permit, and they could also choose to have three people help, help them if they so chose. And then, of course, since this isn't a traditional hunting season, um, again, stipulated by the Fish and Wildlife Service, obviously they couldn't use calls, blinds, or decoys. They're pretty much limited to... Uh, pass shooting and jump shooting opportunities only. And then uh, we were also really fortunate that uh, Sportsman Against Hunger was willing to uh, work with us and provide the funds to process those geese as well as find processors that would accept those geese as well. So uh, that component worked, uh, worked really well. So we ran this program for the month of April and uh, focused in on these areas that had a long history of chronic damage, um, private land only, um, GFMP prior to the season, contacted these landowners, um, secured all the access, so that was taken care of. Those are the six counties that uh, the program uh, was in. And then uh, we had an online registration period for two weeks where we had uh, more than 1,200 folks registered for those 140 slots, so a lot of interest from sportsmen. Again, uh, two different approaches, just to touch real quickly. Region 4 up in the northeast, Day County was open. Um, those individuals had 90 permittees plus their three designees, and then we provided a map. Um, this map to them looks pretty similar to our walking area atlas. Um, of all the open areas, we had approximately 75,000 acres of private land opened up um, during this uh, program. Down in Region 3, a little different approach. They had five counties down there and uh, 50 permittees, and what we did down there was uh, GFMP went ahead and secured access with specific landowners, and then we paired up volunteer hunters with those landowners. For example, um, you know, the first volunteer, volunteer hunter A, he went to landowner B and hunted just on that landowner's property for the specific, uh, or, or on those specific lands for the entire month of, uh, entire month of April. Uh, and the hope for that was really to encourage some landowner hunter interaction and hopefully there was maybe a possibility of a relationship being established between that hunter and that landowner where perhaps that individual would be welcome back to hunt in the fall. So again, uh, first time we've done this, wanted to, uh, wanted to try two different approaches. And then uh, if we decide to do something similar like this in the future, really evaluate which one worked, worked better and try to apply that uh, across the areas. So the results, obviously we had a real, real, real late spring, if you folks recall. Um, really, I'm going to call them poor hunting conditions, although it wasn't technically hunting. Um, a lot of the same type of conditions out there and, and uh, techniques that uh, w would occur with hunting. Harsh conditions, a lot of snow and ice. I talked to folks up in Day County um, well into the month of April. Those folks still had 20 inches of snow on the ground and most of the water bodies were froze over. Then, of course, uh, the 2013 ice storm in Sioux Falls hit as well. 
Um, we had some anecdotal comments from some folks that said that uh, they sure would have gone out, but uh, with all the ice storm they had, they had to take care of things at home and weren't, weren't able to get out there. So we had uh, lower than anticipated uh, participation. So what did we accomplish? Well, we harvested uh, 820 Canada geese. Again, we authorized the take of 7,000. We were hoping for at least 60 per, or 50% uh, success. But uh, two things I want to point out there. Day County harvested almost 300 birds with 90 individuals. And down in Minnehaha County, where uh, the weather was more conducive, um, we harvested almost the same number of birds with only 17 hunters. So again, just demonstrating that weather really did play an impact, particularly up in Day County. Um, we also had uh, a couple people that were concerned that uh, with the late spring, a lot of migrants were still in South Dakota, that there was a chance that these individuals that were out there permitted um, would harvest some of the migrant geese that, that are just passing through South Dakota, not the resident birds that set up shop and are causing damage. So uh, we worked with different processors to uh, weigh the Canada geese when they came in. They weighed these whole birds, and then based off the weight, um, would give us a real good idea if those birds were reg resident birds or migrant birds. I worked with uh, Rocco Morano, our uh, senior waterfowl biologist. He did a literature review and came up with basically that uh, any bird that weighed nine pounds or more could be considered a resident bird. And uh, that's the number we used here. So uh, we were able to harvest 76% 76, 76 of the total harvest. And we uh, sampled birds both from up north in Day County as well as down south. So we've got a really good representative sample. And we ended up, uh, ended up finding out that uh, we did indeed harvest a significant number of resident birds um, just as we had uh, anticipated. We uh, did do some uh, additional educational material to the people that were selected, so uh, those efforts paid off. So the final results, uh, again, the 820 geese way down from what we expected. Um, really difficult to evaluate the success of this program off of what our initial objectives were. Um, the thought when we first started this program was to haze geese away from these problem areas, lower that population at a real local level, and then, uh, of course, reduce the damage that's that occurs at these areas, which would in turn reduce uh, our agency's efforts as far as expenditures uh, to curb that damage. Some of the accomplishments, though, I do want to point out, um, we found that there really was um, a, lot of, a lot of strong public support, both from sportsmen and loan, landowners. Um, talked to a lot of folks uh, around eastern South Dakota and other areas, um, very, uh, very supportive of this program. Had a lot of good positive comments from sportsmen's groups, so uh, really happy to see that. Uh, another accomplishment, we also had really good access to private lands. Almost all the landowners that we approached um, to open up these properties, where we've been doing depredation work on in the past, um, for the most part, opened their doors to these hunters, so that was another good thing to see. We also learned that the Fish and Wildlife Service would actually allow us to, to use uh, quote-unquote hunters underneath this permit to kill geese in the spring. Uh, and then we also can uh, target specifically resident birds even when there's a significant number of migrants in the area. Um, hunters are pretty, uh, pretty able to be selective and really target and key in on those resident birds. And then obviously uh, Sportsman Against Hunger was willing to work with us and uh, the processors as well um, so we could donate those birds because under the, the permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service all those birds that are harvested have to be donated to uh, some food charity or charitable organization. So Sportsman Against Hunger, that outlet worked, uh, worked really well for us. Um, I think that's it. With that, I'd uh, take any questions or comments. That's a photo somebody sent to me uh, from a building uh, down in the very southeastern part of Region 3 there. They got a complex that's nicely groomed lawns and have a large number of geese every year, and they had a pretty hasty one, I guess, right outside their door, so. Any questions, I'd be happy. You know, uh, Commissioner Cooper, we, we kinda put out a goal, we'd like to see at least 3,500 birds, 50% harvested, but, uh, you know, we were just kind of shooting in the dark as far as uh, what we really expected, so. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
The next, next is the private shooting preserve. Good morning. Um, I'm going to quickly go over uh, basically the harvest information and application information for private shooting preserves for this last fall and this upcoming coming season here. Um, preserves in the state had a had a wonderful, very successful year. Um, uh, again, this year we had a slight increase in the number of applications that were received by the department. Uh, for this upcoming fall season, the department received 206 applications. All 206 applications were approved and permitted um, for this upcoming 13-14 season. Uh, actually, permits went out earlier this week. Um, and I believe you have information in your packets that summarizes all of this. Uh, during last fall's 2012-2013 season, uh, permits, or I'm sorry, preserves across the state released over 400,000 rooster pheasants. Um, this is an increase over the previous year. Um, the increase was about 16,000 roosters from last year. Uh, the harvest totals for the 2012-13 season were down slightly from the previous year. There was 237,965 roosters that were harvested on preserves. Um, the percentage or, of marked or rather released pheasants on preserves was uh, again up from the previous year. 85% or just over 200,000 <coughs> released roosters were harvested on preserves, whereas 15% or just over 36,000 wild roosters were harvested. The preserves also reported a 28% harvest rate of chucker partridge, a 34% harvest rate of gray partridge, and a 44% rate of harvest rate for bobwhite quail, and an 80% harvest rate for turkeys. Um, the, we're also seeing that more preserves are taking advantage of the increased daily bag limits. This year we had 13 preserves that took advantage of the increased limits. Um, which is a per person, per person harvest of 16 birds or more from a single year. Last year we only had three of our preserves take um, advantage of that. So their records indicated an average um, of 55.6 man days where 16, more, 16 or more birds were harvested on a single day. So for this upcoming fall season, uh, again, we'll have 206 permitted preserves involving 175 permittees. The total land in preserve uh, for this fall will be 1, or 199,379 acres, which gives us an average preserve size of 960 acres. Okay. If there's any questions, I can take them. Um, it, 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 there's some that did. We had some that they didn't renew, but the preserve still s is active. It changed ownership, or it went from a father to a son who is now operating it, that kind of. So while it's technically the same preserve, we still count it as a drop and then a new preserve. So we, we have about a half a dozen brand new first time preserve operators with new land that's in the system. Any other questions? Just um, wanted to quickly um, bring the commission up to speed. We did uh, issue a couple of notice of warning letters to two preserves. Um, in our review process, we'll ask our conservation officers and, and uh, regional staff to review uh, those preserve applications. And, and uh, in those situations where we've had preserves who've received citations or we have other uh, complaints or potential violations, um, we try and document those through that review process and, and uh, so we did send out two uh, two letters essentially they're they're notice of warning letters that bring, bring to the uh, operator 
uh, or the preserve manager's attention the fact that they are, um, you know, operating in, in violation of the uh, statutes and or regulations that uh, are designed to, uh, you know, ensure that that the preserves operated as uh, as intended and in accordance with our, our statutes and regs. But um, we did uh, send out those two uh, notice of warning letters and, and essentially uh, invited the uh, preserves to uh, uh, meet with us and uh, discuss these uh, these violations. And uh, um, essentially, it's just a part of the, the way that we handle preserve uh, or intend to handle um, all these preserve uh, applications in the future. Um, essentially, what it does is um, is, is open a pitch count, I guess, uh, 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 of sorts to uh, place the preserves on notice that, you know, the continued violations could potentially result in, in a future denial of your operating permit. <coughs> and uh, by placing them on notice uh, gives them that, that first opportunity to consult with us and, and uh, hopefully pre prevent uh, uh, potential denial in the future. So, so like, what would, what would put you on notice? I mean, um, like, what, were the, what would be a... For, for one of the uh, preserves that operates over in the Highmore area, um, we had uh, several complaints that were voiced to our conservation officer, actually reported to the uh, local state's attorney. Uh, we had a few hunting parties that were uh, Bigger. at least claiming they were um, being uh, uh, harassed while they were legally hunting in, in and around the preserve. Uh, that particular preserve operator also uh, failed to contact our conservation officer when he released birds um, on, on a uh, particular occasion. Uh, we brought that to his attention. The other preserve, uh, actually through the course of the last couple of years, uh, were issued written warnings and I think there were a couple of citations that were issued for uh, um, failure to tag harvested birds. Uh, sometimes we have records violations um, and, and that was an issue in this, uh, this particular situation. And I think this, <clears throat> this individual actually shot a red-tailed hawk um, and was issued a citation by the conservation officer. So. Um, those are just kind of the, some of the, uh, the issues that are out there and, and uh, you know, we certainly want to give the preserve operators every chance to, uh, you know, operate in accordance with the, the uh, requirements and, and uh, this is just a, a way that we can provide them notice that, you know, you're being watched and, and the, you know, the requirement is that you comply with all the, the statutes and regs. So. Okay, so I have a question. Just going to throw this one out. If a regular hunter shot the red-tailed hawk, would they lose their license for two years? The, uh, a hunter uh, potentially could lose their license for a year if, if they were cited for, they could be cited for taking a protected bird, which wouldn't entail a, a, um, a uh, revocation. But, you know, normally they would be cited for uh, taking a bird during a closed season or potentially a, and that would cited be for a federal a violation. And misdemeanor, and so they would still keep their license? They wouldn't lose their license? Uh, under, the, under the other... The, the, the first instance, if they were cited for a shooting protected bird, would this be a class two misdemeanor as, as would the other violation, obviously, but uh, one requires a, for close season or, or no license would be a, a loss of license. You know, one of the challenges with these, uh, these uh, essentially occupational licenses, if you will, with, with the uh, preserves is that they're quite different than a, you know, a, a hunter <laughs> hunting. Are they a, really? I well, don't see a difference. Breaking the law is breaking the law. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the challenge for us is this is a, uh, a uh, you know, business operation. And so the challenge that we have is to ensure that, you know, these businesses are operating in accordance with, uh, you know, the statutes and regulations um, and place them on some kind of a due notice, um, almost handling it in, in a manner similar to a personnel action where, you know, you give them a chance to, uh, to comply, um, bring to their attention, you know, those situations where they're, they're not in compliance. Um, but because of the, you know, potential huge financial impact of these, these operators, you know, we want to give them, um, you know, some reasonable um, opportunities to, to get themselves back on track. And in some cases, you know, you, you, the preserve operators don't always have full control of, you know, the people that work for them. and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the opportunity that, that I think the notice of, of warning uh, does is, is it, it sort of puts them on notice that, you know, future violations will be dealt with more, more harshly. So it's, it's almost a, 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 a track. So right. how many warnings do we give them? Uh, they'll get one. One? Yep. 
That's all they'll get. They'll get one, one warning and, and uh, you know, our, our intent would be then to uh, advise them that, you know, it would be our intent not to issue the, the, uh, the, the license um, or that potentially they, they could uh, have their permit revoked, um, you know, if they were operating while, while an act took place. Um, and then, you know, the opportunity there would be you know, rather than proceed with a full revocation and bring, bring that to a contested case hearing before the commission, we could enter into a, a stipulation and agreement as we've done with a few cases in the past, whereby we would ha actually have uh, the preserve operator sit down and, and uh, you know, likely working through their legal counsel and working with Dick Neal, our legal counsel, develop a, an agreement whereby, you know, these are the standards of operation. Uh, this is what's gonna happen, you know, over the course of the next year. Essentially, it's more of a, a almost a formal probation, so to speak. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Thank you. Good job, Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, we have a presenter, the same presenter for the next three okay. uh, information items, and I, I think uh, Mark Fetzel, our senior uh, biologist on the Milwaukee Reservoir here, has kind of packaged those into one PowerPoint. Okay. So we'll um, be able to. Kill three birds. All right. We might get done today. Is that what you're telling us? Okay. okay. We'll see. <laughs> he hit the lights. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioner, Secretary. Uh, like Tony said, I just put all three updates into 